In the spring of 1863, the Scott County settlements along the banks of the Big South Fork River were as remote as any place in Tennessee. It was a two-day trip to Huntsville, the county seat, a hamlet of less than 100 people. It took weeks for news from the outside to filter into such a place. Yet the Civil War was as much a part of their lives as anywhere in the United States. Large armies with charismatic leaders did not write the wartime history for places like Duck Shoals. Instead, it was a civilian war, and a murderous one at that. Marauders and bushwhackers, loosely organized gangs with doubtful ties to any army, roamed the countryside. Here, the war knocked on the door and demanded entry. According to local lore, such a knock came to the door of the Tackett family in 1863. Bushwhackers were known to take boys and press them into service, but the Tackett women were ready. Their boys were hidden under the mattress. The grandmother then lay on the bed and pretended to be ill. Hours later, when the bushwhackers left, the women lifted the mattress, only to find the boys had suffocated. Oral histories can grow into myth, and Civil War mythology runs strong through the generations here. But in the 1970s, two small graves marked by crude headstones were located near the ruins of the Tackett cabin. Today, the stones are being reset. For much of East Tennessee, these spasmodic outbursts of community violence marked the Civil War years. It was a war where combatants most likely wore no uniforms nor fought from recognized battle lines. One exception was a cold and bloody morning at an earthen fort in Knoxville, where today its memory alone remains. Less than 4,000 people lived in Knoxville in 1860, yet it and Chattanooga were the population centers. The remaining East Tennessee residents were widely scattered in small towns and farms across the river bottoms and ridges. The economy was based on agriculture, but it was different from the plantation-based agriculture of the Deep South. Slaves were not... Uh a large part of the population here, unlike many other areas of the South. And it gave people a different perspective on things. When a Republican, uh, Abraham Lincoln, is elected uh, on a free soil ticket, that is, anti-slavery, uh, intending to stop the spread of slavery to the West, uh, a lot of Southerners found that very frightening. Uh, but, but Southerners in East Tennessee uh, and other areas of the South, say Western Virginia, where slavery was not important, where the planter class was not uh, important. They saw things differently. They didn't feel as threatened by a, a Republican president. In June of 1861, two months after the firing upon Fort Sumter, Tennesseans voted by a better than two to one margin to secede from the Union, the last state to do so. However, in East Tennessee, 69 percent voted to stay in the Union. You can't pin it down through a scientific formula. Uh, but the minority, secessionist minority, tended to be people who lived along the rail line, lived in the towns, and were more connected to the rest of the South uh, economically. Uh, they also tended to be Democrats more than Whigs. Uh, the Unionists tended to be people who were uh, uh, a little more isolated, who had no connections with the, uh, the uh, rest of the South economically, uh, who lived far away from the railroad line. That, that was an important determinant, but again, it wasn't a, you know, a hard and fast rule. 
Despite the predominance of Union sympathies led by the strident newspaper editor, Parson William Brownlow, the Confederate cause had a strong following. Finding common ground between the two factions would prove impossible. Gay Street in downtown Knoxville, for instance, had rallies where both sides worked the streets simultaneously. The city of Knoxville had voted for secession. Knox County had done the opposite. Sensing the coming conflict, the campus of East Tennessee University was empty. Many students and faculty joined the army of their preference. In July 1861, Confederate military forces occupied Knoxville. They would hold the city for nearly two years. Aside from an excursion into Kentucky, the military government's energies were used to quell a feared rebellion in the local population. In the process, the fires of retribution were set and then fanned. The jailing of Union sympathizers, execution of railroad bridge burners, and disarming of the citizenry further embittered a divided community. The Union military bypassed East Tennessee for two years, much to the dismay of Abraham Lincoln. While East Tennessee's railroad was important to the Southern effort, it was not critically important to the Union military strategists. Middle and West Tennessee were more important than East Tennessee in this regard. West Tennessee because uh, it, uh, it's bordered by the Mississippi River, which was crucial to Union strategy, and Middle Tennessee because uh, Nashville and Chattanooga needed to be held in order to open uh, the way to Atlanta, which was another one of the Union's chief military goals. President Lincoln valued the area because there were so many Unionists there. He was reminded of that repeatedly by Tennessee's military governor, Andrew Johnson, who later became Lincoln's vice president. Despite Lincoln's urgings of field commanders to go into East Tennessee, it was wartime happenstance that ultimately presented the opportunity. Union General Ambrose Burnside began a long-awaited move into East Tennessee in the summer of 1863. Confederate troops evacuated Knoxville and went to North Georgia to reinforce General Braxton Bragg. On September the 3rd, 15,000 Union troops entered the city to the cheers of the long-suffering Unionists. As he set about to strengthen his position, Burnside turned over much of the work to Captain Orlando M. Poe. Confederate forces had begun an earthwork they called Fort Loudon, west of Knoxville. It was incomplete at best, but could serve as the center of the defensive effort for the city if needed. The Confederate Army won a bloody battle at Chickamauga Creek in North Georgia, but allowed the Union Army to escape to Chattanooga. Feeling the Union Army was contained in Chattanooga, General Bragg split his forces and sent General James Longstreet's First Corps to retake Knoxville. Bragg and Longstreet had been feuding openly after Chickamauga. Confederate President Jefferson Davis devised a plan to separate the two generals. It boggles the mind as to why it was done. There was a major concentration of fresh Union troops going to the rescue of the Union forces in Chattanooga at exactly the same time that the Confederates were dispersing their limited troop strength outside of Chattanooga. And this uh, violation of basic military strategy seems to have been uh, a matter of little concern to Bragg and Davis and Longstreet. Longstreet left Chattanooga quickly, without accurate maps or knowledge of the country he was to travel across. Ulysses Grant, now in command of the Union forces in Chattanooga, was elated. A strategy was devised for Burnside to confront Longstreet and slowly fall back, drawing Longstreet's 17,000 men farther and farther away from Chattanooga. With a force of about 5,000 men as bait, Burnside's goal was not to be eaten alive. In some ways, it's unfortunate that a lot of historians and students of the Civil War simply focus on Fredericksburg as the defining moment of Burnside's career and assume Burnside was a bad commander. And the truth is, is not. That Burnside had really good abilities in smaller units. He had good abilities where he had freedom of operation, freedom of decision, in perhaps regional areas of operations that were of secondary importance to the Union cause. Back at Knoxville, Orlando Poe had men at work on the earthworks surrounding the city. The pick and shovel would ultimately prove to be the most effective weapons in the Union arsenal. There were additional hands at work here. They were called contraband by the Union Army. More specifically, they were African Americans, slaves that sought refuge with Union forces, or frequently, were pressed into service. The Congress has passed a contraband uh, confiscation act, 1861, and then they passed another one in 1862. 
saying to the Union commanders in general, you can take these people and you can consider them freedmen, you know, if they were uh, used by their masters in the rebellion, their contraband of war. The conditions were terrible, uh, especially in the wintertime, you know, for these people. But the fact that they were willing to leave their homes, the only homes they knew, and, and uh, escape and follow the Union Army shows, yeah, they knew what, uh, what they were doing and they knew where they were going. Bragg had promised Longstreet supplies at Sweetwater, but they never arrived. Left to scavenge the countryside for food and forage, Confederate artillery commander Edward Porter Alexander found East Tennessee rich in neither, nor particularly friendly. My recollections of the place are those of the struggle we had to get enough to eat. The residents in all that East Tennessee country were very much divided in their allegiance. We learned that bushwhackers were abundant, and all strangers were regarded with suspicion. The weather now turned unseasonably cold. November 13th, Longstreet sent 5,000 Confederate cavalry under General Joseph Wheeler off to test the Union defenses to the south of Knoxville. Approaching Knoxville, Wheeler found his advance repeatedly blocked by Union cavalry led by Brigadier General William P. Sanders. Sanders was a daring 30-year-old officer born in Kentucky and raised in Mississippi. His family claimed close ties to Jefferson Davis, and two of his brothers fought for the Confederacy. His role in the days ahead would be pivotal. Ultimately, Wheeler's force would discover that the southern approach to Knoxville defended from the high ground, which became Fort Dickerson, was too much for cavalry to handle. On November 15th, Longstreet crossed the Tennessee River at Huff's Ferry. Five miles upstream, Union forces started their race back to Knoxville. Longstreet divided his column, sending McClaw's division on the Kingston Road, while Jenkins' division pursued Burnside on the Loudoun Road. If Burnside, who had now joined his troops in the march, did not make it to Campbell's station first, his men would be caught in Longstreet's pincers. It's a race for Knoxville to see who can get there. Burnside has to get there safely in order to fulfill his strategy. Longstreet's best opportunity for winning the campaign is to catch him before he can do that and fight him in the open field before he gets into his settled uh, defenses around the city. The weather worsened. Cold and rainy, the roads soon turned into mud. Wagons of supplies were either burned or abandoned by the Union troops. Man and beast were soon exhausted. The main body of Burnside's forces arrived just a few minutes ahead of McLaw's troops. Wagon after wagon of Union artillery and supplies crossed through the intersection. However, Longstreet now had the opportunity he had hoped for. He had Burnside in open country, but the ground was not in his favor. Even with 12,000 troops opposing 5,000, Longstreet could neither crush nor flank Burnside's hastily constructed battle lines. It was the key. Campbell Station was the turning point of the Knoxville campaign. And it was, I think, vintage Burnside. This is what Burnside is capable of doing when he has the right circumstances. At nightfall, Burnside resumed his retreat to Knoxville. His men marched for a third consecutive night without sleep. He urgently sent a message forward to Captain Poe to prepare the fort at Knoxville for the final stand. Poe had everything planned out in his mind as to exactly what kind of earthworks were going to go where and which units should be shifted there to start digging them as soon as they got to Knoxville on the night of November 16th. And he did a magnificent job. At 4 a.m., 5,000 exhausted men who had survived their ordeal as bait arrived in Knoxville. Later that day, Confederate troops arrived in Knoxville and began to dig in and then probe the Federal lines. While work had been done to prepare the Knoxville defenses, they remained unfinished. All now understood the necessities of the situation, and but little urging was required to induce the troops to work with a will. Lines of rifle trenches soon appeared. Captain Orlando Poe. Captain Poe needed more time. Burnside called upon General Sanders to keep Confederate forces back until noon the next day. Sanders promised to do so. Later in the evening, he told Poe, his friend and West Point classmate, that he would hold the position well past noon. Sharpshooters positioned in the tower of the Bleak House on Kingston Pike continually harassed Sanders' men. 
Sanders appealed for help from the fort. Judging the distance to be 2,500 yards, Lieutenant Samuel Benjamin took careful aim and fired with a heavy field piece. Marks still seen today show the shot went directly through the tower. It sent the sharpshooters fleeing. Poe declared it to be the prettiest single shot of the entire war. In the face of direct assaults and artillery barrages, Sanders rallied his troops throughout the day. In the afternoon, as he returned to his command position, he was shot. Shortly after Sanders was carried from the field, the Union position collapsed. The young general died the following morning in a makeshift hospital room in the Lamar house. His funeral was held at night, attended by Burnside and his fellow officers. The solemn procession observed silently by a young woman, Sue Boyd, whom he held dearly. At the head of the procession went the commander in chief and the minister. By their side walked the medical director of the army bearing a lighted lantern in his hand. That lantern did duty at the grave as the body was committed. It seemed as if war, disrobed of its pomp and pageantry, had taken its departure. Reverend Thomas Hume, 1863. In honor of the slain general, the earthwork the Confederates started and called Fort Loudon was now officially named Fort Sanders. Today's landscape has completely obscured a sense of the 1863 field. With development stripped away, this was the look of the countryside just west of Knoxville's downtown. The layout and construction of earthen forts was an exact science, but Fort Sanders was imperfectly located. Because of the lay of the land, an opposing force could mass close to the northwest bastion and yet be out of harm's way. The bastion also had a significant field without fire. It appeared the rate of fire from the fort simply could not stop an appropriately large attacking force. In truth, it was a brutal place, made more so by the mind of Orlando Poe. He had a ditch constructed at least six feet deep and 12 feet wide in front of the earthen walls. When standing in the ditch, it was nearly 20 feet to the top of the parapet. Planks used by soldiers in the fort to cross the ditch could not be seen and made it appear deceptively shallow. Along with limbs from felled trees, the field in front of the fort was littered with tree stumps. Poe had telegraph wires strung from stump to stump to create a nearly invisible entanglement. The weather remained cold. An assault on a heavily fortified enemy was not Longstreet's style yet neither could he entice Burnside out from behind the walls. Bragg was growing increasingly nervous in Chattanooga and ordered Longstreet to do something soon. In the early morning hours of November 29th, Longstreet made his move. Confederates had occupied the Union rifle pits in front of the Northwest Bastion just before midnight. They had no scaling ladders, no picks or axes to cut a foot or handhold in Poe's deadly wall. They included Longstreet's best men, battle-hardened veterans who had seen action at Fredericksburg and Gettysburg. Edward Burris of the 21st Mississippi Infantry wrote to his father. My eyes were watery from cold, but this became more so from deeper cause as I looked down the line of half-clothed, less than half-shot heroes and saw their knees actually smiting together and their teeth rustling like dry bones, and then thought of the terrible struggle that awaited them. Inside the bastion, the 79th New York Highlanders held close to the revetment. Initially, the defenders in this part of the fort numbered just over 100. They faced nearly 4,000. On the signal, three brigades from Mississippi and Georgia rose to the attack. We follow the journey with a typical squad from General Walford's Georgia Brigade. They were told not to halloo, but could not help themselves. In the darkness, they encountered Orlando Poe's telegraph wire strung from stump to stump. While a surprise, the wire only slowed the attack momentarily. Whether it was fire from the fort, the darkness, the entanglements, or the ground itself, the attacking Confederate columns became disorganized. Command and control were compromised, but the attack pressed forward. Despite fire from the parapet, most of the squad made it to the ditch, hesitated but a moment, and jumped in. They soon discovered it was much deeper than they thought. 
Without ladders or picks, they could not scale the walls. My vision of what happened on the morning of November 29th is that only the first few ranks of those brigade columns actually got into the ditch and actually stayed near because if you're very close to the earthwork and you can't go any farther, it's dangerous to go back because you're exposing your back to a lot of enemy fire. So they stay where they are for safety. It's only the, the two-thirds of the people in the rear, the rear two-thirds of the columns that have a good opportunity to quickly turn around and go back. And I think most of them did do that. Defenders in the fort, now numbering as high as 500, could not fire into the ditch without exposing themselves. Men in the ditch could not shoot out. For an eerie moment, the sounds of battle died away in the dark. Longstreet's artillery commander, Porter Alexander, thought the fort had been taken. Then, Lieutenant Samuel Benjamin of the 2nd U.S. Artillery executed his deadly scheme, lighting shortened fuses on Hotchkiss shells. He heaved them over the side and into the ditch. The effect was terribly predictable. Yet, the attack continued. Climbing on shoulders, some would make it to the top. In places, the fighting would become hand-to-hand. -hand. Two medals of honor were awarded to defenders in the Northwest Bastion. But for the most part, the battle's outcome was determined when the Confederates entered the ditch. The slaughter was over in 20 minutes. As soon as the firing stopped, Corporal John Watkins of the 19th Ohio Battery looked in the ditch. And such a sight I never saw before, nor do I care about seeing again. The ditch in places was almost full of them, piled one on top of the other. They were brave men. As General Longstreet contemplated another assault, a messenger arrived. Grant had broken out of Chattanooga and was driving Bragg back into Georgia. There would be no second attack. A truce allowed both sides to remove their dead and wounded. Of the 813 Confederate casualties, most of the 129 killed died in the ditch. The Union side claimed losses of five killed and eight wounded inside Fort Sanders. Longstreet was blocked from returning to Bragg's aid in Chattanooga. He spent a frigid winter in camps throughout East Tennessee and engaged Union forces in a number of skirmishes. His presence was a major concern for the Union leadership. Nevertheless, he returned to Virginia and Robert E. Lee's command in the spring of 1864. Burnside, too, returned to Virginia, but did not have the success he enjoyed in the East Tennessee campaign. When the war ended, Tennessee was the only Confederate state under federal rule, and thus did not undergo federal reconstruction. However, radical Unionist Governor Parson Brownlow was relentless in his attack on former Confederates and Southern sympathizers. Many of those former Confederates joined together to oppose Brownlow's regime with violence through such organizations as the Ku Klux Klan. While there are very few physical remnants of the war left in East Tennessee, in truth, there is much that marks those four dark years. Remember that the, the blacks after slavery don't go too far, except for the, uh, the northern migration. So that's why you're going to still see the contraband camp patterns uh, transform into black neighborhood patterns in Knoxville and Memphis and Chattanooga and Nashville. In 1869, the conservatives, that is the former Confederates and their, and their allies, uh, achieved control of the state again, partly through violence, uh, partly through fraud, uh, partly because they outnumbered the, the former Unionists. And uh, with that, we see a pattern set in Tennessee politics that lasted a long, long time. That is, the Republicans being dominant in East Tennessee, uh, the Democrats being dominant in Middle and West Tennessee. Not 20 years after the war, the earthwork of Fort Sanders was beginning to disappear. In 1890, the country's first ever reunion of North and South combatants was held on what was left. After another reunion in 1895, John Watkins of the 19th Ohio Battery wrote back to his wife. It will soon be of the past. Boys are helping to tear down the parapets to find bullets, and they get lots of them. We can locate the place where our guns stood all right. Now there is a big house built within a hundred feet of it, and a road is graded right through the works between where we were. Remnants of the fort were gone by the early 20th century. Today, only a marble marker stands near the point of the attack. Few notice.
A message inscribed on a medal given to the men who attended the 1890 reunion proved prophetic, simply stating, its memory alone remains.